is the uh, first book that uh, was written about the bat and kill by a gentleman who's passed away by the name of John Merwin, and it's a fantastic read if you don't have it. You might want to track it down. Um, I will actually be putting out a book next year that'll be coming out next June that's more of an angler's guide. John's book was has a little bit more of a history of the region, so mine is a little bit more fishing focused. And um, what's interesting is, and as we get going, is some of the stuff I found in uh, his book, and he didn't have the easy ways to look up things that we do today. You know, just sitting on sitting at your de sitting at your desk and being able to get information just by clicking in a couple of wor search words. So I found that a little of the information that he had uh, wasn't quite correct. So I was able to get some information that wasn't presented in this at the time. Uh, but this is a fantastic book called The Bat and Kill by John Merwin. Well worth, if you're, if you're a bat and kill folk person, you want to get it. And then you can get mine. Uh, okay, so let's kind of talk a little bit about my process. So uh, as I said, you know, it's pretty simple, uh, much easier today than 20, 30 years ago to get information just by sitting at your desktop. And uh, I subscribe to a... Uh, search engine called uh, newspaper desk, newspapers com, and it gave me accessibility to newspapers all over the country uh, dating back to even the Civil War and even a little bit earlier. And just by using simple search terms like uh, bat and kill brown trout I, and putting in a specific year, I was able to get more information than I could uh, possibly uh, absorb. But, you know, it was pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, it was a fun journey to find out what I learned. Um, and what the important thing is that a lot of the uh, information I had, because I was looking at it at the year it was published, it's contemporaneous. It's, you know, current to the time that it was being reported. And um, so, so I was able to get me information that wasn't as easily accessible previously. So that's how I went about my research. Uh, go in this direction. Uh, ba -ba. So what, would the, what was the common understanding of uh, when, the bat, uh, when the brown trout when brown trout were first introduced to the bat and kill? Um, as I said, I'm referencing John's book. Um, he stated that he could find nothing prior to 1930 where, where brown trout were into the, introduced to the river in Vermont. And that's important. And he could find no references to bat trout, bat and kill, the bat and kill holding brown trout in Vermont before 1922. And um, he suggested that the bat and kill didn't really have a brown trout fishery until about 1935. And as we'll find out, that's probably off by about uh, a good 20, 25 years. So what happened was, so I, you know, obviously util utilizing this book, I always figured, okay, 1922, fair enough. And then when I was doing my research for other parts of the, my book, I kept seeing the brown trout being referenced in Vermont well before 1922. So the question I asked myself was, okay, if it was prior to 1922, when was it, and who was it that introduced the, trout, the brown to the uh, bat and kill in Vermont? Um, in terms of uh, New York, it was very simple. I just reached out to DEC and they gave me the specific date, which was 1899. They got 5,000 trout from the uh, Caledonia hatchery out in New York, which is still active to this day. Um, it's kind of a neat place if anybody ever gets out that way. Well worth uh, checking out. Um, I'm showing a picture of this little uh, young of the year, actually just to swim up fry, just to point out that back in the day, you know, prior to about 1930, maybe a, uh, about 1930 from what I've been able to tell, Trout that were being stocked into our rivers were not the 8 inch, 12 inch, 14, 18 inch fish that they stock now to produce an instant fishery. They were smaller fish. These are, Courtney caught these fish last year, Courtney, and uh, they're roughly 3, 4, 5 inch fish. And again, the other one was a little swim up fry. Um, so they were stocking much smaller fish. They weren't stocking catchable sized trout. They were trying to reestablish fisheries without thinking about the angler first, but trying to reintroduce fish into the system that had been lost to uh, the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, so where do we start uh, with all that? So we can talk about the first uh, tr big trout that was caught on the Battenkill, 
or one of the biggest trout reported on the Batten Kill, and that was a 12 pound, two ounce fish caught in the spring hole, uh, not, excuse me, not the spring hole, but the Dutchman's hole down in New York um, by a gentleman by the name of Roy Brown, who later on, uh, I think he took that fame as far as he could and opened a tackle shop down on the spring hole called the Tackle Box. And uh, he caught this fish as a youngster in May, on May 5th, 1924. And why that's important is previous reporting had had it as 1930. So that's six, year, that's six years prior to previous reporting. So a 12 pound brown trout at, in 1924, I'm thinking is at least a five, six, seven year old fish. You know, I can't imagine growth rates were that, that great. So I'm thinking, okay, trout have to, these trout have to have been in the river prior to the 1920s, probably somewhere, you know, in somewhere in the, you know, certainly we know 1899 in New York, but whether or not this was a Vermont fish that made its way down to New York, we don't know. So anyhow, you know, I backdated that and said, okay, something was definitely happening prior to, prior to the 30s. And this is just a photo of the, uh, of the uh, Dutchman's Hole as it, uh, as it is today. Obviously, this was a few weeks ago when there was still some ice on the water, and there's a couple of fellows fishing there today when I drove up. And then, uh, so I said, all right, let's start working back from 1924. Uh, what do I find out? And um, in 1923, it was reported that the Manchester Rod and Gun Club planned to stock 35,000 brown trout below Manchester Depot, and they were going to leave the two primary tributaries, the east and west branches, as havens for brookies, which is kind of interesting uh, that that thought process was being considered, uh, you know, introducing a non-native species and trying to maintain uh, some area for the brook trout only, which was kind of kind of interesting. And um, one of the interesting points about this is I was never able to tell whether or not this was actually enacted because apparently the Rod and Gun Club had a difficult time finding the money to actually bring this into being. And one of the points about this too is that at that time, uh, the Fish and Game Department in the Vermont Fish and uh, Wildlife wasn't as well developed and local fish, fish and game clubs did help out a lot with uh, stocking, uh, stocking local waters and they actually helped out with, uh, with um, uh, making sure that regulations were being adhered to. Uh, Ken, or Ken, you might be able to uh, speak to that, but um, I believe that's a fairly accurate statement. Um, and uh, so that being said, you know, whether that actually happened, it's hard to say. Um, and then the next attribution was the same one that uh, John Merwin mentioned in 1922, which was uh, there was talk of building a stripping station in from taking fish from Arlington, which would mean that spawning age fish coming up the river to uh, lay eggs, there was talking about taking these fish, bringing them down to the Bennington hatchery, stripping the uh, eggs out and uh, uh, fertilizing them with the uh, milt of the male fish, and they were to be put into the uh, exclusively into the uh, batten kill. And again, hard to say whether or not that took place, but there was talk of it. Um, the same year, which is really interesting, is that there was a big major fish kill reported uh, on the Batten Kill and the Green River above a series of dams. Specifically on the Batten, on the Batten Kill, it was at the uh, dam here in Arlington, the Canfield Dam. Uh, and this is the remnants of the dam, Oops, sorry. This is the remnants of the dam right here. I took that picture yesterday. It's very uh, slowly deteriorating. It used to, I'd say 10 years ago, there was stone coming, you know, all the way across the river, but it's slowly eroding. Um, but what was interesting is, so the, there was a lot of fish that were reported to kill, specifically brown trout and suckers. Uh, there were no brown, brook trout that were found in this fish kill. So it was theorized that the brookies, maybe feeling the water getting warm, got out of the area before the oxygen was depleted. And it was such a significant event in this area that they sent fish down to Smithsonian Institute to try to find out what it was that killed those fish. And it was determined that, um, that there was a lot of sawdust that had built up from one of the upstream mills and warm water, low flows combined to uh, starve the uh, river of oxygen above these dams. And as a result, there was a kill off of fish. 
But what's important, what's important, I think, to point out is that they a significant number of fish. So fish were in the river. You know, the brown trout were in the river at this time in significant numbers. And it was a big enough deal that people were, uh, you know, concerned enough that they were getting uh, Washington involved. So again, there's a picture of the dam today, or what's left of it. Um, now the question becomes, well, okay, New York was stocked in the river, could the New York uh, be uh, creating a fishery for Vermont, which I'm sure the folks in Vermont would greatly appreciate, you know, save a little bit of money and uh, take New York's fish. Um, so that's a good, uh, certainly a good question, but it has to be remembered at the time that there were a number of dams on the river. You can go down to East Greenwich, Rexley, Eagleville, and a significant dam right in West Arlington uh, at what's now the Red Mill Access Point were all barriers to fish moving upstream. So, and there were also a significant number of uh, tributaries down in New York that to this day serve as uh, spawning, spawning tributaries for, for bat and kill brown trout. So, while it's certainly possible that trout were moving upstream, they would have had to negotiate a number of dams depending on where they were on the river. Uh, and they also had options where they could go into tributaries to spawn, and the bat and kill main stem itself, even down in New York, has good spawning gravel in many locations where they could spawn right in the main stem. So were these fish just moving upstream and slowly creating a, um, the population in, uh, in Vermont? Certainly something to consider. And here's an example of the sort of brown trout that moved through some of these tributaries. This is on Camden Valley Brook down in New York. A picture taken two years ago, that's about a 20, 22 inch brown. And you can't see it, but underneath all that flotsam, there was another one just hanging out. Um, so these are the sort of beautiful fish that we see running through our streams, all these little tributaries that uh, feed into the bat and kill. You know, if you ever come out in the fall, which a lot of us do, to count reds, something you might want to do, you'll see fish like this that you, you, you wouldn't believe were even in the main stem. And it's a pretty neat thing to see. And this is just another picture of Camden Valley Creek uh, where we've done some habitat work and created some nice uh, pool and riffle habitat that will hopefully be utilized by browns to spawn. And uh, just as a side note, uh, on the other side of the stream, uh, I didn't get a picture of it here, but there's a little spring creek that comes in and brook trout uh, utilize that to spawn every year, which is kind of a neat thing to see. And uh, we did a lot of tree planting, so this will start to green up over the next few years. So we don't have an answer at this point. We're getting closer because you can start, in, I found an article in the July 11th uh, edition 1916 edition of the Brattleboro Reformer talking about numerous big, big brown trout being caught in uh, our, the vicinity of Arlington. So clearly there was a, uh, a fishery at that time. And there had been a note within that article that there had been a stocking in 1909. Uh, I'm going to assume that was the state of Vermont that did that. or I'm going to assume that it was done in Vermont. But, um, you know, whether it was the state that did it or not, it's hard to say. Was it a private individual? Um, hard to say. And then here, another article that was found that dating back to 1913 was talk of a big eight, eight pound, six ounce brownie caught at King's Laundry in Manchester. And again, this caught my eye because uh, Merwin, in his book, reported that that exact same fish, he had the exact same article, but he had it erroneously dated as 1936. So, 19, you know, Again, you know, an eight pound fish, if there was a stocking in 1909 for a fish to grow that large, that's an impressive growth rate. So I'm thinking, had to have happened a little bit earlier than 19, uh, 1909. And then finally, I get to uh, an article in the Manchester Journal in uh, 1907. And a gentleman uh, wrote a very long article on the front page talking about a gentleman by the name of C.F. Orvis, which I think most of the people here have heard of. Uh, and other quote-unquote public-spirited citizens introduced brown trout into the ponds that were tributaries of the bat and kill. I'm thinking most likely Equinox Pond being one of those, uh, one of those ponds that was uh, where the fish were put. And then noting that fish in the two to eight pound range were being uh, caught every, uh, um, every year afterwards. 
And what's interesting too is that the gentleman that wrote the article, his last name was Chase, um, he notes that the uh, one bra big brown trout is worth 200 fontanelists, uh, brook trout, uh, for increasing the fame of the river. Which to me is kind of interesting because, you know, br the brook trout is, of course, is our native salmonid. And uh, it sounds like a little bit of boosterism, uh, civic uh, boosterism to say we've got our big brown trout just like they do down in the Catskills or other places. So why don't you come on up here to catch our fish? It sounds a little bit like that to me. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Then going back again, as far back as 1899, they were recording, reporting big, you know, some fellow by the name of John Bradley caught 30 some odd fish uh, weighing up to four pounds in Sunderland, all brown trout. Uh, so there's multiple age classes of fish in the river at that time. And I don't know, I wish he was still around because I'd like to know how he caught 30 fish. Uh, it may take me two months to catch 30 fish sometimes. Um, so that's, I, thought, I thought that was interesting. And then in 1899, there was a report out of the uh, uh, Argus and Patriot out of Montpelier that stated that the, t the state put in 25,000 brook trout into the Battenkill and its tributaries, and Charles F. Orvis received 5,000 trout, trout fry uh, for stocking the tributaries of the river. And I'm thinking to myself, why would Charles Orvis spend money to buy 5,000 more brookies when the state's already doing that. So my thinking is that those 5,000 trout fry that he purchased would have been brown trout. Um, so that's what that, so I'm wondering, is that the first introduction of browns into the Vermont batten kill? And then I finally hit pay dirt. Um, I, ironically, after going back and back and back, it was an article that I stumbled across on April 6, 1944, in the Bennington Evening Banner that notes that uh, it was 50 years ago on that year that brown trout were first finding their way, in, finding their way, into, the, finding their way into the batten kill um, via accidental releases from the ponds to which they were stocked. So there you have it. You know, I think you can date uh, the first brown trout in the batten kill in Vermont as being introduced in, 19, in 1894 and then the first brown trout on the whole watershed would have been 1899 by the state of New York. But those weren't the first exotic species that were introduced into the batten kill. Um, there was something that they referred to back then as the California trout, which we all know as rainbow trout, that were being stocked in New York as early as 1883. And in Vermont, they were trying to stock uh, rainbow trout as early as 1882 which I found interesting. And even more interesting, in 1875, there was an attempt to establish coho salmon for some reason in the Batten Kill, where there was 50,000 cohos put into the river. Um, <laughs> which to me is interesting. If they ever made it all the way down to Diandawa Falls and into the Hudson, they might have had a very hard time finding their way back up. So that's, uh, you know, I didn't want to take a lot of time because it is a beautiful day and that's, what I found out, that's, that's what I learned, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, what, what organization are you with that this, uh, Oh, um, well, I, I'm personally with the Bat and Kill Watershed Alliance, and there's also a Trout Unlimited is a group that uh, they have something called the Home Rivers Initiative that is a watershed-wide uh, um, a, a approach towards addressing uh, needs on the Batten Kill. So they've been doing a lot of restoration work and tree planting. And yes, yes. And there's also the uh, Batten Kill Conservancy, which tends to work most out of New York. They also have been, been doing uh, been doing work down there. You. You're welcome. All right. If that's it, I would say enjoy your day and hopefully go fishing.